good morning and welcome again. You've already been welcomed. We have such an amazing ministerial here in town, uh, ministers that love each other and care for one of those churches. Norbert Hockenfurz is with us here this morning. Welcome, Norbert. He's a priest at St. Peter's um, and um, honored to have you with us this morning and your wife. Uh, welcome. Um, we've, uh, uh, we've been in the Gospel of John. Last Sunday, we reviewed the, the six people who encountered Jesus through the course of the retelling of Jesus' life by John, uh, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, their lives were utterly changed because they had encountered Jesus. Um, uh, for those of you who have been with us since January, you know that was review. And my hope in that was that it would give you a little bit of leverage in some conversations that I'm hoping you would have with friends, with family, uh, following Easter, uh, maybe in the coming weeks, and that um, you just have a little bit more to talk about as you kind of find your way into some meaningful and significant spiritual conversations with the people around you. Um, and as promised last Sunday, this Sunday we're going to meet another one of these people who met Jesus, and their life was utterly changed because they met Jesus. In fact, that's a vast understatement because his life was restored to him because he met Jesus. He was dead. And, um, and, and it kind of pushes us to, to ask some questions about mortality, uh, to ask some questions about life and death, and even beyond mortality as we think of it, um, is there something worse than uh, immediate mortality as we would think of what the scriptures sometimes refer to as the second death? Uh, our narrative this morning is gonna touch on that. Um, his name was Lazarus, he died, and then Jesus raised him to life again. Here's, this is actor Demetrius Troy who plays Lazarus in The Chosen. I'm not sure if he shows up until season four. I haven't seen season four yet. I'm not sure that it's out other than in theaters. Uh, anyway, maybe you want to check that out. It's a fabulous retelling uh, of the accounts of Jesus in some really creative and innovative ways. This morning I'm hoping that you will see that Jesus uh, will resurrect you to himself if you believe and follow him. Jesus wants to resurrect you to himself if you will believe and follow him. So here's how we're going to get there this morning. We're, we're going to review because our text reviews who, who Jesus is. That's what it's pointing to. I want to make sure you've got that clearly. What Jesus is doing and, and then what Jesus is offering. Who he is, what's he doing, and what he's offering to you. So let me jump straight in. We're in John chapter 11. We're going to start at verse 1. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and his sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. We're going to look at that next Sunday. It comes in the next chapter, John chapter 12. So the sisters, Mary and Martha, sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. It's a beautiful appeal. Uh, they're appealing to Jesus on the basis of his love for them, his love for Lazarus. Uh, it's real, it's genuine, and we're gonna have to come back and talk about that because it gets demonstrated in a rather strange way. Verse four. When Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Mary and her, her sister, Martha, sorry, Martha and her sister, Mary, and Lazarus. So, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. What? And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. Now, I'm sure that's not lost on you. That's a strange way to show your love for someone. He loved them, so he stayed where he was, Right? I mean, we, we would expect he loved them, so he quickly finished what he was doing, and then he hurried on to Judea, right? Isn't that what you do when someone you love is in trouble? He loved them, so he dropped everything and beelined for Judea to help. Isn't, isn't that how true love is indicated? So we've got to ask, what's John talking about here? What is, what the, what is going on? And as you may have noticed as we've been working our way through John's gospel, details matter. 
John does not waste his breath or his ink on anything incidental. And so, so pay attention to the details as we work our way through this this morning because they're there for good reason. So why did Jesus delay? I don't know about you, but when I read scripture, I try to ask a lot of questions. Now, if you're new to reading scripture, you probably have no choice. Because you're like, I don't understand that. What the heck was going on there? How did that be? Those of us who have been reading scripture for a lot of years, it can kind of just wash over us. It's familiar. Read, if, if either one, questions are good. What's going on? Why does it say it that way? How am I supposed to understand this? And that's one of the things that's going on here. And we're not alone because when Jesus finally gets to the grave, the people who are there ask some pretty harsh questions or make some harsh assessments of Jesus. Now we'll jump ahead to John chapter 11, verse 37. But some of them said, so Jesus had arrived at the grave where the people were mourning. Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? I don't know, what do you think? Could he have? Yeah, I mean, we've been there through the journey. He's opened the eyes of the blind. He's, he's given people who couldn't walk the ability to walk again. He, this, was, this was easy peasy stuff for him. It brings us to, to maybe another significant spiritual question uh, that we ask as human beings. Uh, we, we ask, what about mortality? What about this death and the scriptures talk about a second death but we also ask about this life where's God when I'm hurting where's God when when things don't seem to be making sense to me and it's going in a direction that I just do not understand that kind of brings us to what what I'll describe as John's lesson number one for us uh, this morning when facing confusing, uh, even distressing circumstances, John's going to ask us, Jesus is going to ask us to just believe. Just believe. Like, I get it. It seems too simple. But just believe because you do not yet have the full picture. I maybe shouldn't put the word yet in there because you may never get the full picture until we get to eternity. And by the time we get to eternity, the question may be of such little consequence, you won't want to waste any of your time with Jesus asking him about that one. Or maybe you will. But the, the point is, you don't have the full picture. Now we do this in our storytelling all the time, right? You, you, you've been watching a movie and you think X is going to happen and lo and behold, it's why. Why happens? You didn't know it, you didn't see it, didn't understand, but it was not what you expected, right? Um, you, you thought the entire Daniel Ocean crew was jailed and the entire episode was a complete failure, and then you discovered that the Fabergé or Coronation egg had been stolen almost before the movie began, and you didn't have all the information, it was not what you thought. Okay, that's just a little reference, a little shout out to Ocean's 12 in case you're like, what the heck's he talking about, okay? Maybe, maybe you're, you're familiar with this one. Um, sh she thought that she was being um, apprehended, captured by the dread pirate Roberts, but, but then he can't, went rolling down the hill and he said, as you wish. And it was that moment she realized it was her true love, Wesley. Now, I don't know why she threw herself down the hill after that, but anyway. <laughs> she didn't have the full picture. It was not as she thought, and that's going on here. Jesus loved them, so he stayed where he was, and we don't have the full picture yet. His disciples have a little more of the picture. Maybe you, maybe you caught that. Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. We scratch our head at that in a moment. It is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Hmm. Can, can, can I believe, when, when I don't have the full picture, I don't see the whole story. Can I believe that somehow God is gonna be glorified in this, through this? I know it hurts. I know it's painful, 
But could I look to Jesus and believe that somehow he's got this? They're going back to Judea. That's complicated. There's a bunch of people there that want to arrest and kill Jesus. Uh, Verse 13. Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake, I'm glad I was not there, so that you may believe and let us go now. But let us go now. Okay, so now they're going back to Judea. It's going to be complicated. When they arrive back in Judea, they discover Lazarus has actually already been dead for four days. Remember what I said about details. Why four days? Like, why would John include that in, this, in his storytelling? Well, this is a bit of detail that, that kind of tells us Lazarus was genuinely dead. That there was a bit of a Jewish superstition that, that thought maybe a person's spirit could linger with the body for up to three days. But four days, no way. So, so just in case anybody had any question about what going on, Lazarus, he's not mostly dead, he's dead, right? All you can do now is go through the pockets and look for loose change, <laughs> right? I, it, 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 it took... So from Jordan where Jesus was, he was on the other side of the Jordan where John had been baptizing, from Jordan where Jesus was to Jerusalem, Bethany's just the other side of Jerusalem, roughly 130 kilometers. How long, how, how long does it take you to walk 130 kilometers? Um, some of you have done it. <laughs> About five kilometers per day. You know, that's, that's typically what's considered. So we're talking at least two, three days, you know, at the minimum. He's been dead four days. Okay, uh, um, and, and we've got all kinds of questions about this. Let's read on. Take away the stone, Jesus said. But Lord, Martha, uh, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Don't miss that detail. His, 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 his body has started to rot, friends. You know, this is, this is dead, dead. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. We we should say that together, because that's just so much fun to say. Lazarus, come out. And then the dead band came out. Like, I just don't want you to miss how freaky this is. His hands and his feet wrapped with strips of linen. Like, we've seen too many movies like this. Cloth around his face. And then Jesus said to them, take off those grave clothes and let them go. Right? Somebody's got to write a song about that. That's, that's worth a dance. Take off those grave clothes and let them go. Like, this is extraordinary. He has been restored to life. Now, as we've been going through the Gospel of John, Jesus does a lot of amazing things. Uh, he, he, he's healed many, many people, and we're, we're only told, like, that's the, the summary we get. He healed many people. <laughs> you know, there's some of them that we get more of the story, and there's seven in the Gospel of John that are kind of elevated to what John calls sign status. They're signs. And we talked about this over the course of the past couple of months. Signs always point to something other than themselves, beyond themselves. In this case, they're pointing to Jesus, they're pointing to the identity of Jesus, and each one of the signs says something a little bit different about who Jesus is and how we are supposed to respond to him. There's seven of these signs. This is the seventh. The raising of Lazarus from the dead is the seventh of those seven signs, and they point to who Jesus is. And in fact, in this case, it's pointing to the fact that Jesus has authority over life and death. Jesus has authority over life and death. Uh, so, so the gospel, the, the signs throughout the gospel, they're helping us as readers track with John. This is not just storytelling. This is storytelling that we would come to believe in Jesus, and in believing, we would be saved. And in, in, in these signs, we are often seeing Jesus doing God stuff. Like, you might just think he was an extraordinary man. He, he gets tired, he eats food, he lives, he breathes, he sleeps. Fully human. 
but he does God's stuff. What do we do with that? Well, we have to come to the conclusion that the church over the last 2,000 years has repeatedly said this is at the heart of orthodoxy. That, that yes, he's fully human, and he is fully God. Now, let's just re re recite the signs, because I think it's maybe helpful to remember them. Do you remember what the first sign was? Remember what was that? John chapter two, wedding of Cana, water into wine. He turned water into wine, and, and it was a demonstration of his love for this couple, certainly, uh, but it was a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, and, and it was the initiation of what we would describe as the end times bliss. The, the wedding supper of the Lamb. It's this anticipation. It's going to bookmark the beginning of the end. From the end of the end, which will be the, be the beginning of all eternity. Uh, it was new wine of his spirit. He says it's all about the Holy Spirit. New wine of his spirit come to enliven the, the people of God. Sign number one, water into wine. I'll try to be quicker here. Sign number two, healing the official's son. That, we came across that in John chapter 4. Uh, this Gentile politician came to Jesus from Capernaum, pleading for the life of his son. Jesus said, go. The guy believed. He came powerless. A man who was powerful in so many circumstances came powerless to do this work here, this desperate situation. Sign number two. Sign number three. Uh, John chapter five. Man whose legs hadn't worked for 38 years. There's symbolism in the 38 years. You could say, well, Jesus was, was just being kind and compassionate. Certainly he was. But this was a man living in Jerusalem, the center of, of the spiritual world, and he's lost all hope. He could never get to the water ahead of time. Uh, sign number five, uh, four, sorry. Sign number four, uh, the feeding of the 5,000. John chapter six. Now, that's when we began to say, hey, this, not only is Jesus doing God's stuff, but he's doing stuff that, that we saw back in you know, Exodus when the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt. He's doing Moses' stuff, but Moses did that stuff by God's power, and we're starting to connect the dots. Sign number five, uh, he, uh, walking on water. Moses walked through the water. Jesus walked on top of the water. What do we do with this? Who is this man? Sign number six, healing the man born blind, John 9. He was surrounded by people who had eyes but could not see. And he was given physical sight to match the spiritual insight uh, that he was coming to have. Sign number seven, this one here, Lazarus raised from the dead, John 11. Jesus has authority, not just over ailments, not sight, not just over the, 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 the elements, food, walking on water. He has authority over life and death itself. And we don't have the full picture yet. We, we're only getting snapshots of this. And, and, and when we find ourselves in, in challenging circumstances, disorienting circumstances, confusing circumstances, the invitation is to continue to look at Jesus because he has the full picture as the story unfolds. Uh, maybe the scene with Lazarus looked a little something like this. The crowd from Jerusalem was hanging around, looking on. They'd rushed out to the tomb, and, and here's an actor portraying Jesus. The one with the authority over life and death is going to call Lazarus to come out. We did it a moment ago. Uh, John's organized his gospel with these significant repeating themes. Um, the, uh, the seven signs would be one of them. They point to who Jesus is, but he also tells us about six feasts. And those feasts tell us what Jesus does or what Jesus is doing. Six feasts. So the, the feasts, some scholars are convinced, the feasts, I'm convinced, the feasts punctuate the gospel of John. And when, when we're told there was a feast, we should, we should read what comes next in light of the feast. Like, it's just gonna color it for us. It's gonna inf inform it for us as we're trying to read deeper and deeper, right? We're trying to understand the scriptures. What's Jesus saying to us here? What's the Spirit teaching us through the word? Six feasts. They, they shine the light of their meaning, what they're about, onto the text. And, and we, we talked about that a couple weeks ago, but, but let, me, let me review this one with you. What's Jesus doing? How do I perceive it? The first feast that we hear about is in John chapter two. It's the first Passover of three that John tells us about in his gospel. That's the one, it comes after the wedding at Cana. Maybe you remember, Jesus was in the temple courtyard 
And he would cast out the money changers and, and the vendors that were there. Like, who's he think he is? Like, he owns the place or something. But then he said this. He said, tear this temple down, and I will raise it again in three days. And all of a sudden, we're saying, what? Who is he? Who's this man? Well, he's, you maybe recall, he's not talking about the bricks and the mortar. He's talking about his body. That he is the temple, and, and, and the physical temple is, is, no, is no longer relevant now that Jesus has come. And we're going to get eventually to John 14 and find out not only that, but what's he doing? What's he do? He invites those who believe in him to be indwelt by the presence of God, and we become temples taking God's presence everywhere we go into the circumstances that are around us. These feasts are pointing to significant realities. The second feast comes in John 5. It's an unnamed feast. It may be just a Sabbath, but that's where where the healing took place of the lame man at the pool of Bethsaida. What's what's Jesus doing there? He's being compassionate and kind, yeah. Um, But but he's taking authority over the superstitions over the false religions, there was this belief in the pool of Bethsaida that, that you, you, when the angel moved the water, if you got in the water first, you might be the one that got healed. The guy could never get in. But Jesus is taking authority over the superstitions, over the false religions, because false religion or misguided religion, religion that's, that's just tipped in the wrong direction, it will ultimately disappoint us. It will let us down. It will leave us lame. It'll leave us discouraged. And Jesus is taking authority over that. He'll he'll say at the second Passover, uh, sorry, at the the fourth feast, come to me, and out of your innermost being streams of living water will flow. I'm getting ahead of myself. We've got the first Passover, the unnamed feast. We've got the second Passover, John chapter six, verse four. And it's in the shadow of that that the feeding of the 5,000 takes place. Who initiated the Passovers? Do you recall that? Yeah, but through who? Who was the prophet? Moses, yeah. That's what, and, and Moses was the guy that led the children of Israel through the Exodus. And now we've got Jesus doing Exodus things. He feeds the 5,000. What well, Moses didn't feed the, the people of Israel. God fed them through Moses. But now you've got someone here, and, and he's not... He's, he's, he's taking the credit for himself. What's that mean? Well, the feast is, we're, we're reading this in light of, of the feast of Passover. He walks on water. Again, Moses walked through it. Jesus walked on it. Jesus is doing God stuff. And we're supposed to pay attention to this because it's telling us about who he is. And the feasts are informing what he does. Feast number four, the Feast of Booths. We've talked about that over a couple of, it it, it takes a big chunk of the Gospel of John, a couple of chapters. John chapter six is where it begins. Again, it's about the Exodus. And in the Exodus, it was all about God's provision and his presence. He was with his people, he was to his people. Now Jesus is here with us. And then Jesus was reinterpreting uh, the things that took place, the ceremonies that were part of the Feast of Booths or tabernacles that took place in the fall. Water ceremony, out of your innermost being, streams of living water will flow. Light ceremony, I am the light of the world. Anyone who walks with me will never walk in darkness. Uh, the, the, the sixth feast, John 13, we'll get to that, is the, the final Passover in the Gospel of John and the death, burial, and resurrection are all gonna be part of that. We talked about that last weekend. The fact that Jesus has been moving toward that Passover with utter intentionality. He will lay his life down. Nobody's gonna take it from him. He will lay his life down on that Passover weekend, and then he will take it up again because he has that authority too. Authority over life and death. And here in, in the fifth feast, the feast of dedication, he's been demonstrating this. Well, what's the feast of dedication? There were three feasts that were prescribed by Moses. Passover, Pentecost, 50 days later, and booths or tabernacles in the fall. But in 164 AD, uh, 100 and, what, 190 years before Jesus is doing this stuff, 
Um, a little army, a little Jewish army led by the Maccabean brothers booted the enormous Greek army uh, that had been led by the, uh, the predecessor of Alexander the Great. Booted them out. They saw it as miraculous, but Antiochus Epiphanes, this leader who came after Alexander the Great, had violated the temple by sacrificing a pig on the altar. Like you couldn't have desecrated the Jewish faith with any more violence than that. It was horrific. To, so they began a process of cleansing in order to rededicate the temple. John chapter 10 verse 22 tells us that Jesus, uh, it, it was this window of time, it was the feast of dedication. It's also referred to as Hanukkah, Hanukkah. And it was in light of this feast of, of cleansing that Jesus is walking through Solomon's colonnade and, 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 and we're like, who is this man? And John is giving us all kinds of detail, inviting us to recognize this is God walking among us. This is Yahweh with skin on. He has come with all authority. And then we get to, in, 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 the, in the shadow of the Feast of Dedication, we come to this raising of Lazarus in chapter 11. And we're to read that in light of the cleansing. There was a huge problem with death in ancient Israel. If you touched a dead body, you were ceremonially, ceremonially unclean. Uh, there, it, was, it was considered to be filthy. It was considered to be violating. Well, Jesus has authority over death and life. Jesus has authority to cleanse. So when Lazarus comes out of the tomb, sin is at the root. I think you know this, but, but let me, sin is at the root of death. Um, Jesus is demonstrating that he has authority over death. He's demonstrated he has authority over sin, and here he has authority to cleanse because sin is what brings the violation that makes us unacceptable to God. And we need to be cleansed. Yeah, we need our sin to be forgiven. Oh, if we're gonna stand in the presence of a holy God, uh, we need his intervention, and that's what the Easter weekend has been all about. Feast of uh, the seven signs, they point to who Jesus is. The, the, the six feasts, we've seen five of them. Uh, they point to what Jesus is doing. The Feast of dedication, had lights, the menorah, candles. You can look that up if you're interested, but it's about cleansing. Jesus has this authority too. John eleven four. 4, he said, this sickness will not end in death. Death is among us because sickness was brought by sin. What, what do we do about sin that's led to sickness and results in death? Like, do we, do we just work a little harder? Do we, do we try to be a little better? Is, is that really the solution? What about everything that's behind me? I can't change any of the things I've already done. What do we do with those sins, with those failures, with those lapses of judgment, with those, those times when I've been openly rebellious against God? I have two stories, two illustrations that I hope will be helpful to you. Um, the first one's regarding sin. Uh, I, I was in the dentist chair on Wednesday. Um, uh, kind of twice, our, our, our dental plan you know, allows for some assistance twice a year. And every time I go to the dentist, I sit in the hygiene's, hygienist's chair, and I am shamefully reminded of my inability to floss often enough. <laughs> now, some of you've got this down twice a day. You're good. I do not. You know, so, so I promise the hygienist I'm going to do better. You know, and I've even promised the dentist I will do better. And, and you know what? For a few days, maybe a week, maybe two, I do better. You know? And then six months rolls around. I'm like, oh man, I gotta see the dentist again. I need to get back at this because I have not done very well at all. I know it's gross, I'm sorry. <laughs> Isn't that kind of how it is with sin? Right? I'll do better. I'll never say that again. <laughs> right? I won't do it again, I won't go there again, I won't see her or him again. Again, again, I promise, Lord, help, give me another chance. 
What do we do about this? Like, are we hopelessly lost to sin? Yeah. Yeah, we are. We are. I, I, we do not have the strength, the ability, the power to overcome sin, but there is one who does. There is one who has been victorious and offers us his victory. You get the trophy without running the race. Like, it's insane. The Apostle Paul puts it this way. He says in Romans 7, 15, he says, I don't understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. It's sin living in me, for I know that the good itself does not dwell in me that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do. But the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Jump down a couple of verses, what a wretched man I am. This is, this is his summary of his situation before he met Jesus. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Verse 25, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's the solution. Jesus is the solution. He's the one who can remedy this this wretched situation that humanity finds ourselves in. Um, Here's kind of my second story or second illustration to try to help us get at this. Because we, like Jesus has authority over life and death, um, but Lazarus died, right? He died and Lazarus would die again, by the way. Um, So was there any real benefit? Like what the heck was going on? This is just an illustration for Jesus to show off his power? Uh, It's certainly that. (laughs) Uh, It's certainly Jesus showing off that he has authority over life and death. Um, uh, Many of you have have experienced the frustration of this. Um, uh, Because I know many of you, at one time or another, have faced a a, a significant medical crisis. Um, You were sailing along, everything was going fine. Suddenly you were confronted by crisis and, and you found somehow the resolve to change. You did much better than me and my dental floss. Somehow you found the resolve to change. I don't know how you did it, honestly. Kudos to you, bless you. But, but the, the, the diagnosis was cancer and you took that wretched medication that made you so sick. And somehow you got through it and the cancer was pushed into remission. Thank you, Jesus. And it's a temporary healing, right? Like, like, there's a 100% mortality rate to the human condition. We all die. Um, To take it out of the medical realm, um, some of you were told, I'm leaving. And and you begged and said, please don't. I'll do better. I'll, I'll try harder. And, 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 and many of you have, have demonstrated Herculean effort and made radical changes in, in order to fix the situation and we all recognize they're temporary because ultimately this life is temporary. It was uh, Pastor Tim Brezo, or Tim in Rocks, um, uh, uh, his daughter, has an an astounding art display at the Okotoks Art Gallery. I would encourage you to take it in. It's there for a couple more weeks. Um, Celebrating age. Um, It's called Ripe and the Beauty of Aging. Um, And and, and the poignant point is that not everybody gets to age. Some will die young. Um, Anyway, take it in. It's moving. It's moving. Um, Who will rescue us from this body of death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Has he delivered you? Like, like where are you at with Jesus? John's been showing us what he saw. He's been seeing the authority of Jesus to cleanse sin. He's been seeing the authority of Jesus over life and death. But there's this huge question. Does he have authority over you? Have you you given him that charge of your life? Humanity is 
in a life and death struggle uh, with no hope of winning. No hope of winning. There's no Jason Bourne gonna parachute in and, and rescue you out. Well, un- unless we can apply Jesus to that metaphor. I haven't thought that one through. That's dangerous. He's a type of Christ, maybe. Maybe we can go there. <laughs> okay, don't go there. Humanity is in a life and death struggle with no hope of winning. But God stepped in with the offer of rescue. Will you take my hand? Can I give you a lift? Can I pull you out of that muck and mire, that place that you are in? And that's what was going on that first Easter weekend. Jesus laid his life down for you, for me. And he took it up again, demonstrating that he was, he was indeed victorious over sin and death and the grave. And he's offering that victory to you. Lazarus was raised from the dead. It's a little bit like taking your chemotherapy, addressing the cancer. You get a new lease on life, right? But it's only a lease. It's only a lease. It's coming to an end. Lazarus was raised from the dead, but he would die again and face eternity. Jesus, on the other hand, Jesus was resurrected. And one day day Lazarus will be resurrected too. The question is, what about you? Will you be resurrected into the arms of Jesus? And this is, this is what Jesus is offering you. He was at the grave with, with, with Mary and Martha. John eleven twenty five. 25. Jesus said to her, this is the question, I want you to hear this question. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you catch that? First death, second death. Mere mortality, eternal life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die, won't face the second death. Do you believe this? That's a question that Jesus would ask you that he asks me, do you believe this? Seven signs point to who Jesus is. Six feasts show us what he was doing and what he will do. One question separates you from it all. Do you believe? Jesus has this authority to command life and death and resurrection. Have you given him authority, the authority to command your life? To say, Where, wherever you take me, Lord, that's okay. Whatever you want to do, whatever you call me to, my life is in your hands because you are commanding me. I'm not making these choices myself. I'm going to invite the worship team to come and join me. And I want to invite you to stand with me because I want to pray for you. And I want to invite you to pray with me for yourself, if that makes sense. Maybe you'd stand with me and bow your heads. Most holy God, we have come before you this morning into your word, desiring that it would speak to us, that it would shape us, that it would change us. But we come to you in the name of Jesus this morning. And we ask, would you shine the light of your love into our lives today? Would you do that, Lord? Lord Jesus, we come confessing the sin we see in our lives. That's what we need to do, friends. When we come and we recognize that we need to to believe in Jesus and respond to him, we begin by acknowledging, I've been living my life apart from you. I've not given you the the attention that you were deserving of, that you you rightly, uh, should rightly be given to you. So I come and I confess. I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes, friends just to quietly own, own our mistakes, own our, our, our ignorance, own our, our rebellion. Lord, we come confessing, acknowledging. This is the stuff. This is the stuff that has separated me from you. 
This is the stuff that has violated relationships that I've been in, that got between me and others. So I confess it, I own it. And I ask, would you forgive me? Will you forgive the mistakes, the ignorance, the rebellion? Friends, uh, scriptures say that when we confess our sin, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So Lord, thank you. Lord, we love, love, love your grace. What an extraordinary thing that your victory can become my victory. That your life becomes me. That, that, That out of my innermost being, streams of living water can flow. That I can walk with you and you become the light to my dark world. And so now we ask for help to follow. Help to hold your hand and walk closely with you. Lead us in your ways forever. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ.